The surviving history of the black race has been established remarkably on several grounds. One of these grounds is the Samurai chapter. In this chapter, there is no other nation known more for the way of the Samurai than the Japanese. It is a part of Japanese culture. However, there are two great remarkable personalities who lived in different timelines and left an indelible scar on the landmarks of history as Samurais in early Japan. One in 758 AD, the other's date of birth is unknown, though many estimates point to the 1550s. They are, one, Sakanuye no Tamuramaro, and two, Yasuke. You will eventually get to know about these great figures in a moment, but before we continue, don't forget to support our works by hitting that like button in front of you. Share with your families and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative, and kindly subscribe to stay put and help build the rising membership of the channel. Sakanuye no Tamuramaro, the great shogun of Japan. Of the black people of early Japan, the most picturesque single figure was Sakanuye no Tamuramaro, a warrior symbolized in Japanese history as a paragon of military virtues, and a man who has captured the attention of some of the most distinguished scholars of 20th century America. Perhaps the first such scholar to make note of Tamuramaro was Alexander Francis Chamberlain from 1865 to 1914. An anthropologist, Chamberlain was born in Kenning Hall, Norfolk, England, and was brought to America as a child. In April 1911, the Journal of Race Development published an essay by Chamberlain entitled The Contribution of the Negro to Human Civilization. While discussing the African presence in early Asia, Chamberlain stated in an exceptionally frank and matter-of-fact manner, and we can cross the whole of Asia and find the Negro again. For when, in far-off Japan, the ancestors of the modern Japanese were making their way northward against the Ainu, the aborigines of that country, the leader of their armies was Sakanuye Tamuramaro, a famous general and a Negro. Dr. W. E. B. Dubois, from 1868 to 1963, perhaps the greatest scholar in American history, in his book, The Negro, first published in 1915, placed Sakanuye Tamuramaro within a list of some of the most distinguished black rulers and warriors in antiquity. In 1922, Carter G. Woodson, from 1875 to 1950, and Charles Harris Wesley, 1891 to 1987, in a chapter called Africans in History with Others, in their book, The Negro in Our History, quoted Chamberlain on Tamuramaro verbatim. In the November 1940 issue of the Negro History Bulletin, founded by Dr. Woodson, artist and illustrator Lois Mayu Jones, from 1905 to 1998, contributed a brief article entitled Sakanuye Tamuramaro. In the article, Jones pointed out that the probable number of Negroes who reached the shores of Asia may be estimated somewhat by the wide area over which they were found on that continent. Historians tell us that at one time, Negroes were found in all of the countries of Southern Asia, bordering the Indian Ocean and along the East Coast as far as Japan. There are many interesting stories told by those who reached that distant land, which at that time they called Tsipango. One of the most prominent characters in Japanese history was a Negro warrior called Sakanuye Tamuramaro. Very similar themes were expressed in 1946, In the Orient, the first section in Distinguished Negroes Abroad, a book by Beatrice J. Fleming and Marion J. Pride, in which was contained a small chapter dedicated to the Negro General of Japan, Sakanuye Tamuramaro. In fact, the list could just go on endless. Testifications upon testifications of the great Negro warrior and samurai legend of early Japan. The great Joel Augustus Rogers, 1883 to 1966, who probably did more to popularize African history than any scholar of the 20th century, and had at some point devoted several pages of the first volume of his sex and race to the black presence in early Japan, 
where he cites the studies of a number of accomplished scholars and anthropologists, and even goes as far as to raise the question, were the first Japanese Negroes? Had also mentioned Tamuramaro briefly in the first volume of World's Great Men of Color, also published in 1946. Regrettably, Rogers was forced to confess as follows. I have come across certain names in China and Japan, such as Sakunuye Tamuramaro, the first shogun of Japan, but I did not follow them up. He continued solemnly. Sakunuye Tamuramaro was a warrior symbolized in early Japanese history as a paragon of military virtues. Could it be that this was what Dr. Diop was alluding to in his first major book, Nations Negres at Culture, when he directed our attention to the tantalizing and yet profound Japanese proverb, for a samurai to be brave, he must have a bit of black blood. The peculiarity of Tamuramaro's daring martial exploits as a samurai in early Japan had given rise to the renowned Japanese proverb. Rogers must have learned of things concerning the legend that shook his very thoughts. It was said that Tamuramaro had the strength of over a hundred men in him. This was no exaggeration. He often went out with few and came back conquering very many. He danced in deadly battles with some terrible intelligence for war as though it was game. His eyes and rigid hands everywhere. He was in tune with the air, was often mistaken to be more than no less than 50 people in the battlefield, killing and wounding many almost at once. His strength was beyond human, inexhaustible, his speed, untrackable, leaving an unsurpassable legacy in the landmarks of history. Serving Emperor Kanmu, Tamuramaro was appointed shogun and given the task of conquering the Emishi, a people native to the north of Honshu, which he subjugated. Sakanuye no Tamuramaro was indeed an outstanding Japanese military commander and samurai who lived an unsurpassable icon during the Heian period, from 794 to 1185. To say the least, he was an unmatchable guard of the early Heian royal court and imperial palace, known for his great military achievements and contributions to the early consolidation of power in Japan. Tamuramaro played a significant role in suppressing the Emishi people, who inhabited the northeastern region of Japan and resisted central government control. Appointed by the Emperor Seiwa to lead campaigns against the Emishi in the late 800s, Tamuramaro successfully led his forces in battles and played a key role in subjugating the Emishi resistance. Recent evidence suggests that a migration of Emishi from northern Honshu to Hokkaido took place sometime between the 7th and 8th centuries, perhaps as a direct result of this policy that predated Tamuramaro's appointment. However, many Emishi remained in the Tohoku region as subjects of the expanding Japanese Empire and later established independent Fushu domains. After Emperor Kanmu's death, the general continued to serve Emperor Heisei and Emperor Saga as major counselor, dinagon, and minister of war. It is said that the famous Tanabata festivals and parades of Aomori Prefecture, also celebrated in the city of Sendai in Miyagi Prefecture, which draw over three million people to the prefecture a year, were popularized in remembrance of Sakanue, no Tamuramaro's campaign to subdue the tribal societies then living in Tohoku. These annual Matsuri are called the Nabuta Festival in Aomori City and Naputa Festival in Hirosaki City. They feature a number of gigantic, specially constructed illuminated paper floats. These huge festival structures are colorfully painted with mythical figures and teams of men carry them through the streets as crowds shout encouragement. Aomori's great Nebuta lanterns are said to hark back to Tamuramaro's innovative strategy in that early 9th century campaign. According to legend, the Taishogun is remembered for having ordered huge illuminated lanterns to be placed at the top of hills. And when the curious Emishi approached these bright lights to investigate, they were captured and subdued. Until the mid-1990s, the prize awarded for the best float of the parades 
was called the Tamura Maro Prize. However, there is no historical record that Tamura Maro went farther north than Iwata Prefecture. Tamura Maro's name is linked with payments for construction projects at Kiyomizu Temple, Kiyomizu Dera, in the late 8th century. Adwoa Asantewa B. Munro referenced Tamura Maro in the 1981 publication What We Should Know About African Religion, History and Culture, and wrote that he was an African warrior. He was prominent during the rule of the Japanese Emperor Kwamu, who reigned from 782 to 806 AD. In 1989, Dr. Mark Hyman authored a booklet entitled Black Shogun of Japan, in which he stated that, the fact remains that Sakanuya Tamuramaro was an African. He was Japanese. He was a great fighting general. He was a Japanese shogun. Sakanuya no Tamuramaro is regarded as an outstanding military commander of the early Heian royal court. The Heian period, from 794 to 1185 CE, derives its name from Heian Kyo, which means the capital of peace and tranquility, and was the original name for Japan's early capital city, Kyoto. It was during the Heian period that the term samurai was first used. According to Papineau, the word comes from the very word samuaru, or better saburao, which signifies to be on one's guard, to guard. It applied especially to the soldiers who were on guard at the imperial palace. The samurai have been called the knights or warrior class of medieval Japan, and the history of the samurai is very much the history of Japan itself. For hundreds of years, until the restoration of the Meiji Emperor in 1868, the samurai were the flower of Japan and are still idolized by many Japanese. The samurai received a pension from their feudal lord and had the privilege of wearing two swords. They intermarried in their own caste, and the privilege of samurai was transmitted to all the children, although the heir alone received a pension. The paragon of military virtues, Sakanuye no Tamuramaro, 758-811, was, in the words of James Murdoch, in as sense the originator of what was subsequently to develop into the renowned samurai class, he provided in his own person a worthy model for the professional warrior on which to fashion himself and his character. In battle, a veritable war god. In peace, the gentlest of manly gentlemen and the simplest and unassuming of men. Throughout his career, Tamura Maro was rewarded for his services with high civil as well as military positions. In the year 797, he was named Barbarian Subduing Generalissimo, Sei I Tai Shogun. And in 801 to 802, he again campaigned in northern Japan, establishing fortresses at Izawa and Shiwa, and effectively subjugating the Ainu. In 810, he helped to suppress an attempt to restore the retired Emperor Heisei to the throne. In 811, the year of his death, he was appointed Great Counselor, Dinagon, and Minister of War, Hiobukyo. In the year 811, Tamura Maro died at age 54, to the great regret of Emperor Saga, who expressed his sense of loss by distributing large quantities of silk cloth, cotton cloth, and rice in honor of his dead counselor. His bow, arrows, quiver, and sword were placed in his coffin by order of the Emperor. Sakanuye no Tamura Maro was buried in the village of Kurisu, near Kyoto, and it is believed that it is his tomb which is known under the name of Shogun Zuka. Tamura Maro is the founder of the famous temple Kiyomizu Dera. He is the ancestor of the Tamura Daimyo of Mutsu. Tamura Maro was not only the first to bear the title of Seitai Shogun, but he was also the first of the warrior statesmen of Japan. In later ages, he was revered by military men as a model commander and as the first recipient of the title Shogun, the highest rank to which a warrior could aspire. Tamura Maro's legacy is celebrated in Japanese history and culture. Many stories, legends, and artistic representations depict his exploits. 
further solidifying his status as a historical figure of significance in Japan's early history. Looking forward centuries later, in the 1550s, another great black samurai would rise in the heart of Japan, Yasuke. Arriving on the shores of Japan in 1579, during an era of strife and war, a black slave to Portuguese Jesuit monks would rise through the ranks to become a figure of legend. Remembered only by his Japanese name, Yasuke would find himself at the side of one of Japan's most famous historical figures, Oda Nobunaga, the Demon King. So great was the warlord's trust in his African samurai retainer that he was one of only a handful at his side when he was assassinated in 1582 at the Hanoji Temple. In the annals of history, few tales resonate with such audacity and defiance as that of Yasuke, the slave who rose to become a samurai, a warrior in the heartland of feudal Japan. Not much is known about Yasuke's early life. Some historians would say he was a native of Portuguese Mozambique, others say somewhere in the Congo, while other historians would say Nigeria. Some historians would insist that he was a slave, but others say that he could not have become an accomplished samurai so quickly without having come from a warrior background. But the truth, however, remains that he was certainly from somewhere in Central or Western Africa, as that was the region where most slaves came from. Thomas Lockley, co-author of African Samurai, The True Story of Yasuke, a legendary black warrior in feudal Japan, says it's possible Yasuke was enslaved and trafficked as a child, but believes he was a free man by the time he met Alessandro Valignano, an Italian Jesuit missionary, visitor of missions in the Indies, in India. Valignano had been appointed the visitor, inspector, of the Jesuit missions in the Indies, which at that time meant East Africa, South, Southeast, and East Asia. The duo had traveled from India to Japan in 1579, with Yasuke essentially serving as Valignano's bodyguard, while he and his party spent the first two years of their stay in Japan, mainly in Kyushu. Yasuke was employed as muscle because missionaries aren't allowed to have weapons, Lockley says. Japan at the time was in the middle of a brutal century of civil war, and therefore, Valignano needed somebody to look after him. However, Yasuke found himself at a somewhat peculiar time in history, not only for himself, but also involving the world. Two separate yet unique world events took shape during the time of his arrival in Japan. The transatlantic slave trade hit its stride. While the slave trade boomed in Western and Central Africa and the New World, political and social upheaval was taking place across Japan, with warlords vying for control of the country during the Sengoku period. This was soon brought to an end by the steeled determination and military decisiveness of Oda Nobunaga, the Japanese warlord who laid the foundation for the unification of Japan. Entering 1581, Valignano, together with Luis Frois, who had arrived in Japan earlier, decided to visit the capital as an envoy. They wanted to have an audience with Oda Nobunaga, the most powerful man in Japan, to ensure the Jesuits' missionary work before leaving Japan, and Yasuke is said to have accompanied them as an attendant. Reports state, Yasuke's skin was as dark as an ox, surprising to the Japanese. He towered over those around him, even the Italians, as he was rumored to stand over six feet tall between 6'3 to 6'5. There are conflicting reports as to how old Yasuke was when he arrived in Japan. Some sources claim he was just a boy of 16 or 17. Other sources claim he was 26 or 27. But a more substantial source, which was found in the Shincho Koki manuscript of the Sonke Kaku Bunko archives, a chronicle of Oda Nobunaga, which was compiled after Nobunaga's death by Ota Gyuichi, a vassal of Nobunaga describes him as follows. A black bozu from the Christian country has arrived. He appears to be 26 or seven years old. The blackness of his body is like that of a bull, and he is healthy and of fine physique. Moreover, he has the strength of more than 10 men. 
The Padres came with him and thanked Lord Nobunaga for his permission to proselytize. In fact, he created such a sensation that the news of this dark-skinned foreigner reached the ears of even Nobunaga himself, who requested Yasuki's presence at his castle. Luis Froyce's annual report on Japan states that Nobunaga had also longed to see a black man and summoned him. When Yasuke appeared before Nobunaga, seeing a black man for the first time, the warlord refused to believe that his skin color was natural and not applied later, and made him remove his clothes from the belt upwards. Valignano describes how Nobunaga, thinking that Yasuke might have ink on his body, made him take off his clothes and wash his body. But the more he washed and scrubbed, the darker his skin became. Yasuke intrigued Nobunaga the more he spoke with him. The tales of this fantastical land he came from were surely appealing to the warlord. He supposedly was very intelligent and understood the basics of the Japanese language. So Nobunaga requested the missionaries sell him over. Though Yasuke was Nobunaga's servant or vassal, it was a step up from before when Yasuke was merely seen as property and a beast of burden. Yasuke had a set of standards he probably never encountered before. He ate not only at a table with the other Japanese, but often ate with Nobunaga and his family, and received money from Nobunaga and his brothers, either Oda Nobukani or Oda Nagamasu. Nobunaga was also impressed with Yasuke's great strength. Within a year's time, Yasuke had become an inseparable and very noteworthy part of Nobunaga's inner circle. Many different officials, generals, and visitors would take note of this massive African samurai at the daimyo's side, often mentioning him in their diaries. His imposing stature of almost two meters meant that he towered above those around him and was often praised by Nobunaga as possessing the strength of ten men. Yasuke was not just a novelty item for Nobunaga. He allowed Yasuke to don samurai armor and weapons during several instances of battle. This is truly impressive as traditionally only those born into samurai families could become samurai, let alone wield their weapons and wear their uniforms, regardless if they were warriors elsewhere. Nobunaga made Yasuke his weapon bearer, a complex role combining senior aide, trusted advisor, and keeper of state secrets. Yasuke's time as a samurai was brief. By 1582, only two years since Yasuke had become a Japanese warrior, Nobunaga had become the most powerful warlord in the country. In his quest to unify the country under his rule, he had destroyed the rival Takeda clan earlier that year at the Battle of Tenmokuzan, giving him control of central Japan. Nobunaga's only remaining rivals were the Mori, Wesugi, and Hojo clans. Each clan had internal problems of its own. As a samurai retainer, Yasuke was expected to accompany his daimyo everywhere, and in the summer of 1582, he would depart the capital east with Nobunaga to inspect the recently conquered lands of the Takeda clan. There, he would continue to meet with high-ranking and prominent members of the era, including Tokugawa Ieyasu, who would ultimately unify all of Japan and claim the mantle of Shogun. The trip would be cut short by a request for military assistance in the West by one of Nobunaga's generals, and the pair would quickly depart westward, stopping briefly in the Honoji Shrine in Kyoto to rest. Here, Nobunaga found himself betrayed by one of his trusted generals, Akechi Mitsuhide, and the shrine came under attack by the 13,000 soldiers who came with him. Only a few dozen retainers and servants, including Yasuke, who are no more than 30, were with Nobunaga at this point. It's a foregone conclusion. It's 13,000 against 30. Mitsuhide's men slaughtered many of the soldiers in Nobunaga's entourage during the initial ambush. Eventually, Nobunaga, Yasuke, and an attendant named Mori Ranmaru, the feudal lord's lover at the time, retreated to one of the temple's chambers. It was here that Nobunaga performed seppuku, using a sword to slice open his abdomen before Ranmaru beheaded him. Ranmaru then also performed seppuku, asking Yasuke in turn to decapitate him. 
Once both Nobunaga and Ranmaru were dead, Yasuke escaped from the temple with his lord's head in tow. Yasuke had gone to Nijo Shingosho, the residence of Nobunaga's heir, Nobutada, where he engaged the Akechi forces again. By protecting Nobunaga's remains, Yasuke denied Mitsuhide the chance to seize his enemy's head and display it as a way of establishing legitimacy and power. However, the warrior had fought for quite some time until he and Nobunaga's son were soon outnumbered. Nobutada, at this point, committed suicide, and Yasuke was captured. Mitsuhide was not very impressed with Yasuke and dismissed him as a beast and not a true samurai. There are no historical documents to show the true meaning of Mitsuhide's statement, and it is not known whether it was a sign of his discriminatory mindset or an expedient to save Yasuke's life. But some would claim that the reason for this was that rather than committing honor suicide, the norm after defeat in Japanese culture, Yasuke apparently offered his sword to Mitsuhide following Western custom. It was undoubtedly because of this rejection that Yasuke returned to the service of Valignano and soon returned to obscurity. The Jesuits, however, were glad to see that he had survived and thanked God for his return. Beyond his relationship with the famous warlord, Yasuke was a barrier-breaking figure in his own right. Though his life is poorly documented, his story speaks to the surprising cultural connections that existed in 16th century Japan. Yasuke crossed geographic, cultural, and linguistic barriers to create, whether by necessity or design, a new life in a foreign land, says Natalia Doan, a historian at the University of Oxford. The deeds of Yasuke were so great and his conquest for Nobunaga profound that his story lives on, particularly in Japan, where he is best remembered in an award-winning children's book. He has been the subject of documentaries, more books, and even featured in comic books and video games. In closing, this history of these great personalities is a testament to the human spirit's resilience, a testament to how courage can bloom in the most unexpected soil. So, the next time you stand beneath the ancient cedars of Japan, remember the tale of the great Sakanuye no Tamuramaro, the Sei Tai Shogun of Japan, and the tale of the warrior Yasuke, the unlikely samurai. Remember that within each of us lies the potential to break free from our shackles, to forge our own destinies, and to become beacons of courage in a world that often seems shrouded in darkness. This indeed is a testament to the boundless possibilities that lie within us all. That brings us to the end of yet another interesting video segment. Did you learn a thing or two? Share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. We are always delighted to pick from them. Also, don't forget to support our works by always hitting that like button in front of you. Share with your families and friends to keep spreading our eye-opening black narrative and kindly subscribe to help in building the rising membership of this channel. Your support means a lot to us. Thank you for watching.